All right, let's begin. So, uh, so the best time to have a really deep mathematical talk is after lunch, right? <laughs> I think I specifically asked not to have this talk after lunch. So, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Bryce is, uh, is claiming credit. Um, but that's okay. I am super psyched to be here in this room. This is the beta room with really weird, obscure, hard talks. And so this is exactly one of those. I'm, I was super psyched when I found out about this. Um, but anyway, uh, my name is David Sankel. For those of you who don't know me, I work at Bloomberg. And uh, we're going to be talking about the mathematical underpinnings of promises in C++, whatever that means. OK. Uh, this is a math talk. If you don't like math, if you see symbols on a screen, this is not the talk for you. And I won't feel offended at all if you just want to like sneak out. Uh, this is going to be hard, so you're going to have to pay attention. And please uh, stop if you don't understand something. Uh, I want it to be interactive, so if, like, hey, what the heck is that symbol? I don't get it. That's totally OK. So feel free to stop me when that happens. Um, so basically, the, can anybody identify what this is? Circle. Circle, OK. <laughs> More specific? A colored circle. <laughs> a, co a colored circle? OK. Doesn't this look like something familiar? Reminiscent of a planet. Reminiscent of a planet. Very good. Any particular planet? Earth. I can't believe it took this long to identify this as Earth. OK, yes, this is Earth. Awesome. Oh. I think your audience is being intentionally obtuse. Oh, OK. Well, if, if the audience is being intentionally obtuse, I will have my revenge. All right. <laughs> so what is this? Does anybody have, venture a guess? Like, why would I put this there and this here? What is this? Sphere. Sphere. Sphere, Sphere, right. If this is representing Earth, what is this representing? The moon. Moon, no. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll give it away. I'll give it away. I know you guys all know exactly what this is. It's the, the platonic world of mathematical forms. <laughs> okay. I was on the tip of your tongues, and you were just me messing with me. So. What this is is Earth, and this is the platonic world of mathematical forms. Um, Earth is bigger, maybe. Um, so, but this, in the platonic world of mathematical forms, what we have are like math, symbols, these kinds of things that exist in our minds. We can put them on paper and use that to communicate with each other. And they kind of approximate what exists on Earth, right? But they don't replace it. So if you come up with a mathematical model, like a physics model or something like that, it's going to be valid for a certain set of cases. And then there's going to be like some weird things where it doesn't work very well. Um, and the same kind of thing applies to doing a design for software. If you're trying to write an API, it's going to have to end up something like this if it's going to be something usable that people like and enjoy. But if you use the platonic world of mathematical forms to influence your design, you can end up creating very powerful designs. And that's exactly what this talk is about, is a direct application of this principle. So I'm calling this a top-down, bottom-up approach. Um, top-down in terms of you come up with the mathematical model for whatever you're trying to develop, and you start deriving uh, your API based on your model that you found. But then at the bottom up part is, depending on the language that you're implementing this in, or the specific use cases that you have, you might modify it to make it more usable for the, for the real world. So research typically stops here. You'll see like this crazy Haskell program that does this weird thing, and people think it's amazing, and it's a beautiful design, and nobody uses it. Um, in C++, you'll usually see more things along the earthy lines. This is something usable for engineers, and so forth. All right. Uh, this is also a talk about promises. And I just want to get a sense, like, how many people are familiar with promises? Oh, great. Almost everybody. Uh, good. So we're not going to dwell too much on what a promise is. Um, here is an example of a couple different promise libraries. And uh, one is JavaScript. So in JavaScript, you have some kind of promise. You call dot then. It takes in two functions as its parameters, and then you can basically pull the value out of the promise. So whenever this promise gets fulfilled, um, then this will happen. If the promise <coughs> is rejected with an error, then this goes. OK, now stop me if you don't understand what this means. Raise your hand. Like I can go into more detail. But this sounds like it's review for most of you. In C++, uh, basically the idea of a promise got split into two different types. You have a promise and a future. 
Uh, so you create a promise, and then you get the future out of the promise, and then you can spawn a thread and set the value of the promise, uh, detach the thread so you don't get a crazy problem, and then the future will be fulfilled with that value that the promise was set. So they kind of come in pairs, like the promise and the future thing. All right. So generally, if we're just talking very imprecisely, uh, promises include some type representing a value set somewhere. So in the library that we'll be constructing here, uh, that's called promise. In C++, it's called std future. There's a means to fulfill the value or signal an error, and you can include functions to build new promises from other promises. Usually it's then is the name of the function. And the idea is to replace callbacks. Now this is, I'm not gonna talk about how to use this library very much. I'm going with the assumption that this is something that's interesting. Uh, tomorrow I'm gonna give a talk about practical application use cases of this thing. Now we're just gonna talk about constructing a promise library that has generally these properties. Uh, we're going to do, do this with denotational design. So how many of you are familiar with denotational design? One, two, shaky. Okay. All right. That's fine. We'll, we'll go over it. Okay. Denotational design. Here you see a symbol called mu. When you see mu, think meaning. And what we're doing, so remember how we had our platonic world of mathematical forms and our earth this is kind of represented and captured in, in these kinds of formulas. So when you have mu, these bold brackets here, what you see within these bold brackets is syntax, like the syntax of a programming language or something along uh, to that effect. So um, sometimes you might use you know, E sub one to say like this is some kind of expression in that programming language. That's okay, we'll extend it a little bit beyond just the normal syntax. But basically what you see in the brackets here is syntax. So mu of this, so the meaning of this syntax is equal to this over here. What you see on the right hand side of the equal sign, this is something in the platonic world of mathematical forms. And basically what you see is, in this particular example, the meaning of add of E1 and E2 is equal to the meaning of E1, which presumably the meaning of that is some kind of number, plus, in the platonic world of mathematical forms, like the real plus, uh, the meaning of E2. Alright, so this is Basic denotational semantics. Um, you say what the meaning of something is, you assign it. And also note that this usually is recursive. So here we have the meaning of this is equal to the meaning of this on the right hand side. And you can do that with denotational semantics. Isn't the equality kind of fuzzy because add in uh, the computer instructions is not going to be the same as the ideal add in mathematics? So the, the question was. Isn't this kind of fuzzy because the because add here isn't the ideal in doesn't directly map to the add in mathematics? For example, if if these were ints, then it doesn't necessarily correspond with this because sometimes you can have ints that overflow. Uh, so the answer is yes and no. So if these were like infinite precision integers, then this is totally correct. Um, if you're talking about 32-bit numbers, then there's some kind of fuzziness. So in doing this denotational design, you, there is important to have an awareness of the fuzziness, but it doesn't necessarily imp, uh, impact your design. Uh, so you don't dwell on it too much. Okay. So the question is, what is the meaning of a promise or a future? What do you think? It clearly involves the meaning of V. It clearly involves the meaning of V. Absolutely. Yeah, it does. All right. Um, I have a few possibilities here. There's a lot of options. The first one is, uh, I don't know why I switched to U from V. Interesting. Uh, so the meaning of a promise of U is equal to the meaning of U. So a promise of an int is just, it, it's just an int. That's one way of looking at things. You might say that, well, that doesn't really perfectly capture the idea of an error. So you can say the meaning of a promise is the meaning of you. And then now when I'm using plus, I'm talking about in mathematical worlds, uh, when you're talking about plus sums of types, it's kind of like a variant. It's either a meaning of you or an error for some error type. 
Um, you might say, well, that isn't perfectly capture it. What if there's time involved? So a promise becomes fulfilled at some particular point in time. So you can say, okay, well, the meaning of a promise is a time, and then here when I have the multiply operator as a product type, so in other, in other words, it's like a, a pair of this and this. So the meaning of a promise is a time and a value. Or you could say, well, I want both of these, so it's time and the meaning of you or an error. Does that make sense? Question, the last, uh, last formula, does it capture it never arrives, the value never arrives? Ah, so the question was, does this last formula capture that the value never arrives? And that depends on what math you're using. So if you're using, <laughs> if, you're, if you're using math that you usually use in denotational semantics, every type has a particular value called bottom, which represents that kind of a situation. So it, it does capture, but so I, I don't go into detail on that, but it's a really good observation. So what are some operations on promises? Well, there's some way to create a promise which is fulfilled. There's some kind of then function. Uh, there's all, which is called different things in different libraries, but essentially it means it's going to return a promise that contains the value of P1 and P2. That's fulfilled when both of these are fulfilled. And then there's first, which will return one of these two, depending on which one gets fulfilled first. All right, basic operations. Does that make sense so far? We good? On the opposite side, uh -huh. you had the U in the angle brackets and the U on the right hand side in different columns. Could I be reading something like that? No. <laughs> the, the question was, is the font here, uh, does it have any particular meaning? I hate to use that word. Uh, no. Yeah, so they're not different things. That's just a typo. Uh, thanks for asking the question. All right. <laughs> So what we're going to use for the purpose of the beginning part of this talk is the, is the idea that the meaning of a promise of you is just the meaning of you. So if a promise is of int, what would this be? What would the, correspond to in the platonic world of mathematical forms? Int or a number. An int or a number, exactly. Yeah. What if it's a, I don't know, a string? What would it mean in the platonic world of mathematical forms if you is a string? Sequence of symbols. Sequence of symbols, very good, two for two. Um, so yeah, it'd be some kind of mathematical representation of a string. So is, are you assuming that, that, that mu, of, mu of u is always identity then? Am I assuming that mu of u is always identity? I am assuming that mu is mapping this syntax into some kind of mathematical representation. So that, that's what I'm saying. No, nothing more, nothing less. If that doesn't make sense, then uh, I can try to clarify. I'm assuming that it has a meaning. Yes, yes. So if we're talking about general values in mathematics, we know that we have these fundamental operations. Uh, and so I'm using some math syntax here, uh, which is very similar to Haskell, or I guess I should say Haskell syntax is very similar to math. Uh, when you see a colon, that means the thing on the left has a type of the thing on the right, okay? And then the arrow means this is a function type with this is input and this is output. So this fundamental operations on values, we'll go over these one at a time. So we have pure, which will take in a u, of any type u, and return a promise of u. All right, that's just its type. Uh, we have map, which takes in, this is a two-parameter function, and the first parameter of that function is a function itself. So it takes in a function that maps u to v, a promise of type u, and the return value of that is a promise of type v. Does that make sense so far? All right, this is, this is kind of basic. Then we have apply, which is very similar to map. 
The difference is that instead of taking in a function from u to v, it takes in a promise with a function from u to v and a promise of u and returns a promise of v. Subtly different. And then you have a function. You had a promise of your, your last one. Your return type should be... Ah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, someone pointed out that I have a typo. Thanks for that. Uh, so you have a promise from u to v, a promise of u, a promise of v. Then the last one is called join, where you get a promise of a promise of u, and it returns a promise of u. OK? If this, is, this is a similar thing to the other slide when there was just the font issue. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, the way that these work, uh, can someone identify what kind of mathematical things have this kind of a function? No, functor, exactly. What about apply? Applicative functor. What about join? Man, that's awesome. <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk about the different categories uh, because there are other talks that go into the detail on that. Basically, I'm saying, I'm making the claim that these are the fundamental operations on values from a mathematical perspective. All right. And here is the, are the semantics of these functions. Uh, we'll go into more detail on this. We're going to look at what these semantics look like in actual code in a minute here. So promises have a fulfill function. And fulfill takes in some kind of a value and returns a promise of, of t. So how would you implement pure, or remember this fundamental thing, in terms of this other function? Well, you just call it on the inside. <coughs> Pretty easy. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to take these fundamental mathematical operations and make sure that our promise library is powerful enough to express them. So then, as we define it here, if we have a class promise, then takes in a continuation, which is some kind of function. And it returns a promise with the, with the type of promise is the result of f applied to t, where t is that type of promise. All right? So can we implement map in terms of this then function? So I hear yes. Does, it, does anybody think that you can't? No. OK. So for those of you who think you can, what's the answer? Return uh, Oh, you didn't raise your hand. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you, you do a feed of that, then you unwrap the value, you pass it to the function, and then you fulfill it. So what, you, the new value. So what is this? What, what's here? P dot then. P dot then. Uh, you call f with the value inside the promise, and then you fulfill the result of the function. OK. Can we get even simpler than that? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Uh, it depends on how your uh, the, uh, the, the then is. Yeah, so uh, depending on how your continuations work, you get promise. Fulfill uh, P like F. return return P dot then of F. Return P dot then of F. That's correct. That's, that's not with the standard returns, but. That's nope, this is with as defined here. Ah, good question. So why does map take in a std function as opposed to a template parameter f? Well, because these are exposition uh, things. Uh, so the idea is that when we're writing these functions, we're not actually going to use them ever. It's just to verify that our model is correct. Yeah. All right. Now let's implement apply with then. So how would we implement apply with then as we've defined it? So the comment is that you unwrap f and you call p dot then with f. Okay, uh, but we don't have any unwrap yeah, functions. You map. Okay, so you map. So what would what would this look like? This implementation. P map. 
p.mapf. That is going to do what? You could do f.mapp. Uh, well, p is not a function, so that won't compile. It, it, it's actually impossible to do this, given what we have right here. It's not enough. Uh, oh, you want this only with all that we have above? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you need one all. Is it possible to turn that light off? The question is, is it possible to turn this light, light off by any chance? And it is. All right. <laughs> you don't need to see me, as long as you can hear me. All right. So what can we do to extend our promise interface to be able to write this kind of a function? What other kind of things might we need? Gore? I'm just confused why it's impossible because I can unwrap essentially the value from f by the f dot then yeah. and then in f dot then I will unwrap p but by then you, yeah. But then you end with a future of a, yeah. uh, sorry, with a promise of a promise yeah. of, of uh, d. And then you have to join that uh, to get yeah, yeah. actually yeah. promise. I think you can do the operation. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm going to try to repeat that. So the question was, why can't we just you know, do f dot then and then return f of p? And the problem is, is that you'd be, end up returning a promise of a promise of t. And that's not what we asked for here. All right, well, so one thing that we could do is we could add a get method. All right? So here, we implement apply. I'm hearing no's from the audience. You, we implement apply like this. So we do f.get, which will return the function, <coughs> and we apply that to p.get, and then we fulfill the result of that. Wonderful. Is there any problems with this? I like when you get in the platonic world of forms. Not in the platonic world of mathematical forms, which is correct. But how about in the real world? <laughs> Bryce? It, uh, it means your promise needs to have a mechanism block which ties it to a particular so it means that you need a mechanism to block, which means you're tying it to some kind of scheduling resource, which is a really annoying implementation detail, but there's something way even worse wrong with this right here, as implemented. Uh, when uh, either of those gets grows, then the exception will not be wrapped in the promise. Like okay, so yeah. if either of these things yeah. throw an exception, that's a problem. That's not even it. If I call apply, when does it return? It will, it's going to block until both F and P are fulfilled, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of promises, right? Okay, so how can we fix this? So I'm claiming that what we have so far, we got get, we've got then, how can we fix this so that apply doesn't block like that? Yeah, we, we could do f dot then and inside the callback call p dot then. We could do f dot then and inside the callback do p dot get. Yeah, there we go. So now this thing will return, apply will return immediately. It will return another promise. But is there something wrong with this still? Gore. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there is the broken p.get, so we have to have another dot then. There's the broken p.get, so we need another dot then. No, that's not, actually not what I was thinking. I think that this is correct. The problem with having get in general is that it defeats the purpose of having a promise. We don't want to block, because if we block, then we have this whole call stack, which is just sitting there, useless, waiting for this thing to happen. So, can we do better? Can we do something without get in order to write this function? 
just overload from them, so that is the configuration the kernel performance it gets unwrapped before? Uh, the comment was overload then, so if the continuation returns a promise, it'll collapse it basically, so it returns not a promise of a promise, just a promise. Yeah, exactly. So this, I'm using some syntax here, and I'm, I'm going to explain this. Does anybody know what the syntax is? Concepts, right? Requires, requires. Isn't it just the most horrible thing you've ever seen in your life? Uh, no exception. <laughs> my, my my goodness. Uh, but anyway, I'll explain the syntax for those of you who aren't familiar with the concepts TS. What I am saying here is that I'm going to specialize then based on the types that are sent into it. And I'm saying that for a, a value of lowercase f of type uppercase f and a value t of type uppercase t, if you call f of t it's going to return a promise of anything, a promise of some type. Yes, you can do that. Are you sure? So Andrew and I have had this conversation. Are you I am sure. Yes, you can do that. Let's put GCC accepts it. <laughs> yes, you can do that in GCC. No, no, I, I, believe, I believe that GCC accepts it, but I don't believe that that I, supposed to. Uh, as far as I know, uh, this is part of the concepts TS. I remember reading it in the... TS itself. What's the, what's the potential problem? I'm curious. Uh, so on the right hand side there, that can either, it, it can be a concept or a, 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 it has to be a concrete type. But the auto, so the auto is the problem. Yeah, that, that okay. I, that, that, so, so what, what, what is that construct supposed to be? What is promise auto supposed to be there? This is saying that the return type of this matches this thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think you're not. You are. All right. So, <laughs> so anyway, I'm just saying that if then takes in a continuation which returns a promise of some type, we're instead of doing a promise of the result type, we're just doing the result type directly. So we're collapsing these two promises. So this has a problem. So there's a claim that this has a problem, and sure. I'm I'm just gonna say no. no Let's no, move on. No, so no, no, wait, wait, wait. It has a problem of breaking uh, the map. We're, that's a really great observation. There was, I'm not going to repeat it. I, w I would rather have the audience in with the camera to be in suspense about that one. All right. All right. So let's implement apply. How would we implement apply now that we have these two different thens here? What What is the code in here? Anybody want to venture a guess? Yes, exactly. Uh, so I'll just show the answer. And uh, I did it a little bit differently. As you mentioned, I didn't use map. I used then again. In essence, you do f dot then. That's going to take in the std function argument here. And then inside of that, it returns p dot then, which gets the u out of it. And then that returns f of u, this continuation right here. So what is the type that p dot then is going to be returning here? A promise of v. That is correct. OK, so f dot then. The continuation here is returning a promise of v. So what's f dot then going to return? Given that its continuation returns a promise of v, a promise of v, exactly because of the overload. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Raise your hand if that doesn't make sense. Oh, some people are lying. <laughs> That's all right. As was pointed out earlier, we broke map, which was an awesome observation. Uh, it's an observation I had because I had this exact problem with my own. So we have the claim here that it broke map. Here are our two then overloads. Here is map as we defined it. How did it break map? Uh, we're not calling the overload. Well, what? When, when v is 
is a promise of something else, then we do not get promise of being from Mars. Like, uh, it doesn't compile because it's not from Mars. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So, a promise, it doesn't compile. so if V is a promise, so the continuation function returns some kind of a promise of something else, when I call p.then, it's going to hit the second overload and collapse the promise. So p.then is going to return a promise of a promise of something, not, uh, well, no, no, no. It's returning a promise of something when it should be returning a promise of a promise of something. Okay? So how are we going to fix this? A comment, we're going to unwrap it again. Conditionally. Conditionally. I, I can tell you what I do in my implementation. Sure. I have another uh, overload of then that basically takes another argument saying do not unwrap. So <laughs> what was done in, what's your name? Mihao. Mihao? Mihao. <laughs> Mihao, uh, in his library he said he takes in another special overload of then which will take in a, ta a type which is wrapped and then unwrap it. So that's exactly uh, how it's solved here. So we have this type called keep. It's a template class, or a class template, however you want to pronounce it. Um, it just basically has a value on the inside of it. We add a new overload for then, such that if the function returns keep of some type, so if the continuation that you pass into this thing returns the keep, then it's going to take the result of f, which is going to be the keep thing, it's going to use colon colon type, which is the thing inside the keep, and return a promise of that. It basically strips out this extra keep layer. So given this, um, how do we implement map? By wrapping the continuation into keep. By wrapping the continuation into keep. Okay. So what what precisely would we put in that map function? Well, I, w I won't belabor, belabor it because uh, it'd be nice to see what the, map, the signature map is to do this. But anyway, uh, our map function is implemented like this. So first we call p.then to get this promise out, uh, or to get the u out of the promise. And then we call f of u, which is going to be some kind of a value, and we put it into a keep structure, and then return that. And this is going to preserve the, the value on the inside. Okay. So that's when, for example, if, if v is a promise, this is what, when we're going to keep, what's going to prevent the unwrapping. So when v is a promise, this is going to prevent the unwrapping, and that's exactly true. All right, cool. Now join. So remember that join, uh, it takes in a promise of a promise of T and returns a promise of T. How would we implement join with what we have so far? I heard pp dot then and just return the argument. Yeah, exactly. pp dot then takes in the promise, return the argument. The neat thing about this is the types kind of guide what the solution is. You, there's not a lot of different answers. All right, great. We have a promise interface that forms a, a monad. And I think that that's really useful to have. Now our promise interface we know that it has a certain degree of power, and we can say that with an amount of rigor rather than just using vague words. We can say that we have a promise interface that forms a monad. The stood future one does not form a monad. The one in boost does not form a monad because they have these problems. So the idea of taking these mathematical uh, expressions in the platonic world of mathematical forms, what we know about the math, applying it to the interface that we're building it gives us a certain degree of power that we know. Like there are things that can be 
expressed in this interface that can't be expressed in other interfaces uh, because we're we have this monad formation. Does the then method represent something in terms of monad operations? Uh, the question is, does the then operation represent something in monad, uh, mo some kind of monadic operation? So the thing that we can say concretely is that you can implement the monad operations in terms of then, mm -hmm. and you can implement then in terms of the monad operations. So that gives a certain, uh, like the word that's commonly used is isomorphic. Okay, great. How do we improve the design for C++? Now, before we talk about this, uh, there's one thing to, to kind of keep in mind, is that a lot of times when people first get exposed to these mathematical things, the first thing that they want to do is make their interface the monad operations. So you'd have a promise, and then the operations are join and um, apply and all these different kinds of things. Is there a problem with this? Does anybody see a problem with just using, doing the math directly into the code? It's not intuitive. It's not intuitive. Yeah, it's, it doesn't match the use case very well. So I think, uh, well, in my opinion, I think that the usefulness of knowing the platonic world of mathematical forms and applying it is to make sure that you have your library of a certain degree of power that you want it to have. But we shouldn't use that to guide our interfaces. We should have our users guide our interfaces in terms of what works well for users based on the common use cases, um, what, what seems to be coherent with the rest of the language that you happen to be using, these kinds of things. So now we're going to talk about ways that we can improve this design for C++. So what would happen, you know, given what we have so far, if we wrote this kind of a function? So we have p dot then, it takes in the continuation. This contain, continuation takes takes in type int. What's the return value of this continuation? Void. Is this a problem? It is a problem because we don't have any syntax for promise of void or anything like that. So this would just return a compile error. Regular <laughs> void. Yeah. <laughs> if if there was a regular void, then this this would be okay. But we don't have a regular <laughs> void. Right now, this is a compiler error. We, we could add a specialization for void. Uh, the person new to functional programming says, no, just force your users to return monostate. Is anybody not familiar with what monostate is? Oh, OK, there's a few. All right. I'm going to write it over here. <laughs> All right, that's monostate. Wow, that. All right, it's just a struct. It has one one value. Um, that's it. So, it has a very interesting theoretical property. Uh, in functional programming is it kind of represents what a regularized void would represent. But anyway, we don't want to expose our users to this kind of stuff because they would, they would rebel. They would, they would say your library sucks. They may say the library sucks anyway, but <laughs> the idea is we'd really like this thing to work. So what's being done in the library here is we have this idea of an empty promise. A promise which is fulfilled at some point, but it doesn't carry a value along with it. And this is how we're representing it. Just a promise, left bracket, right bracket. All right. Um, if we're going to be doing this empty void thing, then we need to be able to talk about continuations. And here, the continuation function just doesn't take any arguments. So there's nothing here. That means there's nothing here in the continuation. So the continuation takes zero arguments, the continuation can take one argument. What would be the next thing you might want to think of to keep it consistent? Two arguments and arguments. Yeah, so you have the idea of a promise which carries multiple values and then your continuation function 
can uh, bind to those values as they go along. So we're just using C++, this has nothing to do with the math, it just kind of flows from the way that C++ is. Okay, so if you can have a, oh, question? So you would prefer to have this as a, a native thing in the library rather than just comment to people? Uh, the comment is, I would prefer to have something like this native in the library as opposed to promise of tuple, and the answer is yes, because I think it's more convenient. And we, it actually makes the code for the promise easier to write. Yeah. And the comment was, it actually makes the code for the promise easier to write. Yeah. Yeah. Trust me. <laughs> I've done this. <laughs> Matt, was there? <laughs> All right. All right. So if we have this this idea of taking a continuation, like what, what could we return to make this promise, to make a promise that has more than one values in a continuation? Tuple. Tuple. Yeah. If your continuation function returns a tuple, then it'll be a promise of multiple values. Uh, one thing that I find a little bit weird about this is the approach to promise is open and close angle bracket. Um, if I have a function that takes, it's a generic function that takes a function object, and I want to form a promise to the result type of that function, the natural thing I would like to do is write promise open angle bracket example type of function. So the comment is, if you're writing metaprogramming libraries, the more natural thing to do is to have a promise which is returning the result type of the function, and you can use keep for that. So keep has a way for you to opt into uh, the exact semantics that you want. Right, and, and so what I'm thinking is if the function returns void. void yeah. Oh, if the function returns void. Okay, I haven't fully thought that out, but I, could, the intent here is to, this isn't a library used for complex template metaprogramming people. This is, well, it's supposed, I want, to, want it to have the convenience first for the common use case. I'm gonna play devil's advocate. I would probably find it unintuitive to see the tuple implicitly being untapped as the promise. Yeah, that bothers me a little bit. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so the, the place where this gets very useful is when you have when all, and you have a bunch of you know, promises that you wait all on, then you all get all the values inside the continuation unpacked already. You don't have to write code for the get, you write standard get, whatever. You yeah, I understand that you can unpack those. I actually don't think it's going to yeah. work, but it's, it's restructured binding, so it's not that bad, but it's, it's, it's jarring. Uh, it's to still an additional exactly line of code. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. So, so you don't need it to return many values, right? If you want to have a continuation. No, I, I'm fine with Drupal. I don't like the fact that it gets unpacked as part oh. of the promise to me and tied to this. I would like promise of Drupal. Okay, so comment was, uh, uh, you'd like promise of tuple? That's fair. Uh, because you have to return a tuple. The, there, there's a, you know, there's a design question here. So one of the things uh, that came up when I was doing this is maybe we'll have a different kind of thing which is like a tuple that isn't a tuple. So it's kind of like keep is specific to the library. Yeah. So that's a, that's a design alternative. That's totally valid. Another thing I find a little bit strange about this is in the very act of this, right? All of them except for the one case is a tuple, but then if the very addict happens to have exactly one element, all of a sudden it's not a tuple. So that one case kind of, it, it no longer forms like a natural. Uh, so the comment is, is it no longer forms a natural thing. And I totally agree uh, that, but the idea is, is again, we're trying to go with a user interface which is really convenient. The natural thing is the monad operations in the platonic world of mathematical forms. But if you're using a library, uh, and we've used this in a lot of different places, this is such a convenient interface, even though it doesn't map directly to uh, the more mathematical correctness thing. So, so I'm gonna argue that it's not uh, unintuitive. We, I came up with the exact same design uh, for this, uh, having it have the special case for, for the single element, and otherwise be touched with void. I, I think I think this is sort of the intuitive thing to do. I, I understand it's a little odd at first, but. This is actually really powerful. To be clear, I'm not arguing that it's unintuitive. I'm arguing that if you want to write a generic function that deals with the very addict argument thing, it's going to fail for the one case. It'll work for all cases except for the one case where your special case is. 
So the comment is that if you're writing special template variadic functions, it'll have special casing. Yeah, I, it's, it's really not a use case that I care about very much. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep moving on. <laughs> I, hold hold your questions. If you still have them after the next slide, then then we can keep going. All right, so here's just the semantics of then. If the continuation returns void, then is going to return a promise, an empty promise. If the continuation re returns some kind of type T, then it returns a promise of T. And these are the rules. This is the table that you give to your users, and, and then they understand how it works. And yeah, I totally agree that from a theoretical standpoint, this is kind of weird, but from a user interface standpoint for what you do with promises, this is very nice. So if it's just a tuple of a single element, then it doesn't unwrap or does it still unwrap? So if it's a tuple of a single element, does it unwrap or doesn't unwrap? What would you think? It, it does unwrap. It does unwrap. Yes, that's right. Okay. What if it's nested tuples? What if it's nested tuples? What do you think should happen if it's nested tuples? It lists the tuples. Exactly. It lists the tuples. It'll unwrap the top one. Yeah. Does it also work with std pair instead of std tuple? <laughs> uh, does it also work with std pair instead of std tuple? What do you think? Yes. As long as you're calling get on the elements. Uh, the way I implemented it, I just had it work with std tuple. You could do it more generic, like you suggested, uh, call get on the elements, so it'll work with any kind of type which has that property. Yeah, but actually, that's that's actually going to be a problematic. Yeah, that'll yeah that'll accidentally that'll work very poorly with structured bindings. It just makes it more fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You are the person writing like compiler type JSON parser. <laughs> no, that is not. What about if you just ask a promise that has multiple values? So the question is, what what happens if you pass a promise with multiple values? What do you think should happen? I think you should unpack it. I think you should unpack it. That makes sense. All right. Something is still missing from the semantics, though. So we said the meaning of a promise is the meaning of you, or the, the meaning of a promise of you is the meaning of you. But what about these two operations? We have all and first. So all is fine. So recall that all means it's returning a promise that, uh, in this case, is, it contains the value of t and the value of u. So we have a promise of t comma u. Um, in our semantics, we can implement this. So the meaning of all of P1 and P2 is equal to, and this you can think of this notation here as being like make tuple, uh, but basically it's a tuple with the first element as the meaning of P1, and the second element is a meaning of P2. Everything's good, that's fine, right? First is a little bit more tricky. Why is it more tricky? What's the problem with first? Uh, the comment is the type could be one or the other. So we just say that it returns a promise of a variant of the two types. That kind of takes care of that issue. So now nothing assumes scheduling. First yes. Assumes scheduling. Okay. Up till now, nothing assumes scheduling, and this assumes scheduling. That's exactly right. We have no way that we can say we can implement this function. Uh, our semantics just isn't going to work. Okay, back to the drawing board. Let's say that we want to say the meaning of a promise of you is a time with the meaning of you. Okay, so now we're saying that the meaning includes this idea of some kind of a time for this thing. Um, what is time? Like seconds since epoch? Is it relative seconds to like, you know, when a program starts, some kind of a real number? Is it something else? Does anybody have any ideas as to, in terms of what we should use for time? Something ordered. <laughs> That's really good. Um, so let's just say this. Does anybody know what bold case n means in math? Uh, someone raise their hand so I can repeat it. The set of natural numbers. So. Zero, one, two, three. All right, let's try that. <laughs> so our pure, this is the thing that creates a promise. We can just say that it has zero time. Fine. Now first, 
Uh, if you have two promises coming in, one with time value t1, the other one with time value t2, and they each have value one, value two, if this first one happens before the second one, then we'll return t1, v1, otherwise t1, v2. Great, we got a, a good semantics representation for first. Uh, all, which means that when uh, return a promise that occurs when both of these things are fulfilled, then we, the time corresponding to that is the max of t1 and t2, and then it'll return v1 and v2 as the values. Sorry, I'm a little confused, but just to make sure, first implies that both have arrived. So the question is, what does first imply? Does it imply that both have arrived? So what first implies is that it's going to return one of these two promises that come into it, okay. and it's going to return the one that happens first. So it doesn't necessarily imply that both have happened. It, so the, it doesn't necessarily imply that both have happened, no. It just... It's basically looking into the future, okay. uh, predicting that Karen will come first, because this is a real implementation. This is a definition. Right, okay. Yeah, this is, the, this is the implementation that runs outside of time. Okay. Yes. The comment was, this is the implementation that runs outside of time, yes. So I was thinking too concrete. Yes. Because, <laughs> because time is a thing that, that is in the, the world, okay. but time it's doesn't exist convenient. really in the platonic world of mathematical it's forms. Okay. All time happens at the it's same time. It's very inconvenient. Okay, very good. It's very inconvenient. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's do map. So map takes in the function and a promise and returns a new promise of the result. Uh, this should be f of u. Um, but I'm just saying increment the time here because we kind of want this newly created thing to happen after the thing that it came from. Uh, well, this whole thing doesn't actually work very well. And the reason is because in order to implement this kind of semantics, we need to have uh, a T stored in the promises. So if we try to implement this thing, then every single promise now has some kind of a time value associated with it so that we can implement the semantics for first. That's no good. Um, there's also this whole thing. If A is a promise and we have F and G mapping to it, we want this always to return the first argument because they both happen at the same time. Um, if you do it in the reverse direction, then G is the one that should happen first. So you get into all these kinds of weird situations that, well, you can implement promises this way and you get these nice sound mathematical properties. Uh, it actually turns out not to work very real, well in the real world because you're paying a performance penalty for this kind of semantics. So what can we do about this sequentiality issue. You can pay the time storage cost. You can just store the time in every single promise. You could treat it as non-deterministic. So as far as your math mathematical model goes, first doesn't really have a meaning. There's some kind of oracle which, which does this. And that's okay. Uh, but it doesn't really give you a good strong way to reason about this stuff. Or you can build an operational semantics for it. I don't know, does anybody have any other ideas on how to solve this problem? All right, then I guess those are the three ideas. Um, and I, I discovered this sequentiality problem as I was doing these slides. So it kind of like threw me for a spin. But there's a really good answer. This, this is a really beautiful piece of mathematical poetry up here. Basically, there's another kind of semantics called operational semantics, which is different than denotational semantics, which is what we've been looking at so far. And denotational or uh, operational semantics has this idea of reductions. We could go through this, or we could not go through this. <laughs> what do you guys think? If, if you want to go through it, raise your hand. Holy macro. Okay. Okay, we'll go through this. So there's a horizontal line, and the stuff on top of the line are kind of your preconditions. Something happens, like this is, we're assuming this is the case. 
And then on the bottom of the line, there's something and then an arrow and something else. We're moving from this, this particular state of the system reduces to this state of the system. So let me go through uh, each of these in turn. The capital E here, this represents the environment. So when we're doing some kind of reduction system, we have this idea of an environment which exists. If we have an environment, and then we have this statement, so we have P2 is equal to P1 dot then of F, semicolon E. So we're assuming that this is a particular statement in C++ or something like that, and then E are the following statements. Then what we're going to do is we're taking this whole thing in the angle brackets and returning a new thing in angle, angle brackets, and we're saying the environment, we're adding this thing to the environment, which is P1 is a dependency of P2. So we know that P2 comes from P1. And the next expression, which is the equivalent, is E. So it's basically the rest of the things that happen after this are E. Does that make sense so far? Cool. So here, we're saying the preconditions if P1 is a dependency of P2 in the environment, and P2 is a dependency of P3 in the environment, then P1 is a dependency of P3 in the environment. So if you happen to have these dependencies, you, you can assume that, you know, if A goes to B and B goes to C, then A is a dependency of C. Pretty simple. All right, now we're getting to some of the interesting cases. If we have an environment and a promise maps to W, and I'm saying W is the waiting state. It hasn't been fulfilled yet. And P1 is a dependency of P2 in the environment, the same environment that's mentioned over here, then if you have in this environment a call of first of P1 and P2, this is always going to map to the environment of P1. So something that's really interesting about this is that you can do a static analysis of your code using these kinds of rules and you can know before P1, all you have to do is prove that P1 is in a waiting state, then you can re change your first functions to just return P1 there. P1 is waiting, and P2, we know that P2 is a dependency of P1, we can just switch this over at compile time, potentially. This rule over here is basically saying the same thing except for uh, P2 is the dependency of P1 in the environment. So P2 is the result of first. And then finally, in this uh, denotational, or this uh, operational semantics, we have if P1 reduces to V1, okay, so this means that it's not in the waiting state anymore, it actually has a value at this point in the program, and P2 reduces the, to this value, V2, then first of P1 and P2 always maps to P1. So if you have both of these are already fulfilled at the time that you call first, then it will always return the first one. And this, I believe, accurately reflects the semantics of, of all the promise libraries out there. Okay, a uh, couple of questions. Vittoria? How do you handle the possibility where P1 is waiting, but there is no dependency between the two, and P2 finishes before P1? Like, they're both running, there are no dependencies between the two promises, and P2 finishes before P1, and it also returns yeah. P2. So the question is, if there are no dependencies, and you want to see if P1 happens before P2, yes. yeah. how does this capture that? Well, the interesting thing is that it doesn't, <laughs> because it can't. Um, you do not know that a priori. You have to know more information to be able to come up with a reduction for that. For example, this is that's exactly where non-determinism comes into the system here. Okay. Yeah. Why do we need to be in a waiting state? Basically, uh, uh, in order to basically decide that the first one will have to happen first because the other one is dependent on it. So the question is, why does it need to be in a waiting state? Which uh, one of these things are you referring to here? Uh, from the top, <coughs> the third one from the top on the left. Okay. So this is saying that if we know that P one is in the waiting state and that P2 depends on P1, then the result of first is this, is P1. 
Yeah, the question is why do we need the first condition? <coughs> oh, the question is why do I need the first condition? Yeah. Well, if I erase, if I erase this, oh, well, if P1 is actually mapped to a value, yeah. and P2 is dependent on P1, <coughs> P2 could also be mapped to a value. In which case, I can't necessarily say that P1 is going to win here. Well, actually, I guess I could say that P1 wins here, right? Yes, you could. The semantics could say that a, a dependency is always before the dependee. Oh, that's a good point. Uh, this one, though, I think is necessary to be here. Yeah, it's a good point. In the last condition, do you actually care what state P2 is in? In the last condition, do we care what state P2 is in? Ah, you're right. I, I don't care what state P2 is in. So we could cross this out, remove this rule, and I think that that would be simplified do, operational semantics. Do, do we still need the condition for P1 being in the waiting state for the fourth one? Like, if there is, like, uh, depend, dependency depend relation is like orderly, right? <laughs> So you can always you can always say that no matter what happens, the dependency is always ordered before the dependee. So I think you could strike that condition that P one is in the waiting state. That would conflict with the last one, right? Because it will return the first like like the one that comes first in the argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's the only file before they are resolved. If they're both resolved, you have no order. That's correct. Yes, if they're both resolved, then you have no order. Cool. All right. So, I don't have much more to say. Uh, the idea here is to demonstrate top-down, bottom-up design. You find the mathematical essence of the problem that you're trying to solve, and uh, apply it to a bottom-up design. So we started with some kind of assumptions about what the promise library would look like. And there's really no good way to do that. You can look at other existing libraries, um, but you try to take it and see if that's powerful enough based on your mathematical model. Sometimes the mathematical model actually gives you good ideas in terms of what your interface should look like. Um, in this case, I think it was more to make sure that your interface is powerful enough. Um, and then you rinse and repeat. Sometimes you might find your mathematical essence needs work, Sometimes you find that your, uh, your interface needs work and you just keep on doing this thing. And then finally, you say, does this make sense for a normal user in terms of their common use cases? So the benefits of this method is that it's a means for you to find the minimal set of essential methods. So you know that your class needs three methods, and those are your fundamental methods, and everything else is built on top of those three methods, which is really nice from a software development standpoint, standpoint because it means that you only need to think about these three functions when you refactor your implementation. If those remain correct, then all the other stuff that was built on it remain correct. Um, and the other benefit is that you get extremely powerful abstractions because math lends itself to that. Um, for example, if this was applied to the stood future, when stood future first came out, it would have been realized at the get-go, oh, this isn't powerful enough. It really should have been more powerful. And the talk I gave last year, I had mentioned that and I was kind of vague about it. Um, so that is what prompted me to do this this year, uh, to give a, a good application of this, this design methodology. All right, so that's uh, the end of the talk. I am more than happy to take questions at this point. Um, do I have any uh, suggestions for resources to learn more about denotational design or operational semantics? Um, there's a really good book called Denotational Semantics by Schmidt, and I think that it was open sourced and it's available online as a PDF. That is my favorite book on denotational semantics. Uh, I don't know of anything that talks about denotational design uh, aside from research papers in the Haskell community. If you search for denotational design, you'll find stuff there. In terms of operational semantics, there, uh, there's a really good book on that, and, I'm, and the name escapes me. But in the Haskell community, uh, it's very popular. 
it's about writing compilers, in particular compilers of functional languages, and it talks about operational semantics. Um, basically, I think that the best way that I know of to learn this stuff is to really just jump into it, oh, to pick up a piece a paper that comes out that uses operational semantics, and then dig into the references and figure out what it all means. As more, more of a comment. I have, I have a similar implementation which didn't closely follow the law of Monarch or whatever. But what I did is um, I implemented in such a way that basically adding a continuation or a when all is embedded into the type. So it's part of the type system and it builds up this kind of giant promise thing which you cannot spell out its type because it's like a tree of operations. And that basically packages the state required to fulfill the promise and do the various traversal of the tree, basically. Have you ever experimented with anything like that? Because it would probably uh, allow you to generalize the idea of a promise and not have to forcefully use fair pointer or other potentially costly uh, C++ facilities in order to implement continuations and whatnot. OK, so the comment was, is there's another design approach where you, instead of having a, a single type for promises, you can build up really complex types. So that way you don't have to do type erasure on the inside and you can get some kind of performance games out of those things. Uh, in particular with this, I was going for something that um, Joe Programmer can use, like for what we can use at Bloomberg right away. And I think that if we had complex types like that, uh, especially considering we have some users that don't have any access to C++11. Uh, it, without auto, it would be impossible to use. Bryce? Yeah, we, 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 I have a similar implementation. I don't, I don't think that it, it adds uh, significant complexity. I think it's something you need to go and take a look at. I don't, um, I don't, I don't think it's, 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 it's that bad. Okay. You need auto. Like, to use it, yes, you, you, I think you probably do. There's uh, another reiteration that it's interesting, but you need auto. <laughs> so in order to implement, I say implement first, did you, I mean, you can implement it, given the operational semantics you were written, there's loads of rules for implementing it, right? So did, did you, do you still, you still have to parameterize it on the type of data that you have, or? Oh, so the question is, you know, in terms of implementation wise, wise that I have to parameterize it based on the scheduling that I have. No, it turns out that if you use these semantics, there's absolutely no need to mention anything about scheduling at all. It just, uh, it doesn't expose anything which has that requirement, which is really nice, uh, especially when you're binding other libraries. But how do you know if, if your promises are in a wait state without? Ah, I'm so glad you asked that question. How do you know if your promises are in a wait state? Can anybody answer that? You don't. It's, it's not part of, the idea is that you get into this asynchronous model and you don't leave it. You, there's no blocking, there's no querying, you just use then. There's only one member function to this promise. So then how do you encode the operational semantics in your code? How, how do you actually write the condition for the operational semantics? So the question is how do I actually write the condition for the operational semantics? So um, the implementation, we're working on getting this open source, and I'd, I'd like to just point you to that to see, to see how it's done. Um, but yeah, we do it. <laughs> What's that? Is it still a trade secret? Is it still a trade secret? It's not a trade secret. It's just, you know, look at the implementation. It, it, it doesn't have the thing. More? Uh, coming back to scheduling, uh, will it blow up the stack? So coming up to scheduling, will it blow up the stack? When you say dot then and you happen to have it immediately completed the call continuation, and that will essentially launch another operation of this type waging a lot of packets on the on the wire. And they just keep arriving in the buffers before you complete. So you do the then call the then call the then. It all happens in line. Uh, yeah. So if you have nested dot thens, that is kind of like your little mini stack. It's it's pretty much the minimal information that you need to have. Um, I'm not sure. Just uh, try reading uh, in a loop uh, from a synchronous source. Uh, try doing this in a loop. With asynchronous source, yeah, that's exactly what we do. So, um, and 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 it just you are so unlucky that all of those things will be ready by the time you call the then. 
Um, I'd have to look at the exact uh, thing that you're saying. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards and I'd be, be able to better answer your question. So I guess we have kind of a similar comment. Uh, like it depends on how you schedule the uh, continuation. Like uh, you could uh, invoke the function immediately, but you could also just throw it into a threshold and then you have to call it. So, so basically that would be a trade-off, right? Of what schedule are you using? Uh, yeah, it was mentioned that it's a trade-off of schedule. Now I think I understand your question better. Yeah. Um, the idea is, is these continuations execute on the same thread that fulfilled the promise. But it does not restrict the user from, instead of just putting their implementation in the continuation, to throwing it on another executor somewhere else. And, and yeah, and that's actually a very interesting use case, especially if you want to have a single-threaded kind of API layer thing. You can just make sure that everything gets threaded on, everything gets scheduled on this one particular thread so that your users don't have to worry about multi-threaded concerns, which is just a, an idea at this point. We haven't explored it too much. Yeah, creating a single threaded thread pool and is, is kind of nice. Actually. Yeah. Uh, Mike? Um, so I work, in a, I work in a project where we use the future with a band as well. And to answer Gore's question a little bit, we have had issues where um, we wrote a server using that then recursively. And what happens is if you call that function and you hold on to the promise and you recursively keep that bending, because the, the, the caller is holding on to the promise, we end up forming an infinite chain. Um, and that actually does, did actually didn't pull up the stack, it actually pulled up the heap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so what we've had to do is introduce a different abstraction called loop, which actually breaks that cycle of keep it, keep it, uh, keep going into the chain. Uh, so, so the comment was is you didn't just have a chain; you had a cycle, or you're just calling that then into a chain. Yeah. It, well, okay. the cycle, the, the cycle essentially formed an infinite yeah, chain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. we have to break that <coughs> cycle so that we don't end up in an infinite chain. And that's kind of our practice. <coughs> Yeah, uh, so the comment was that if you have a cycle and it keeps on calling itself, you can build up in this infinite chain and that can cause problems so you can break it up and there are means to do that. Uh, so I think, I think neither of the two issues that I see expressed are issues, uh, are, are actual problems. So um, one, you can, to, to, to deal with that, you don't want to blow up your heap thing, you can deal with that because you can do black magic under the hood to sort of tail call optimize the dot then chains. Mm -hmm. It's actually fairly easy and not that expensive to do. Um, but also for like dot then for, 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 for your question about blowing up the stack, just imagine that you have some, some abstract interface where you've got some thing with a method execute and you just parameter, you optionally parameterize dot then on this thing that has a method called execute. And then yeah, you, that's what you're done. Yeah. yeah. I'm not going to repeat that. Any other uh, <laughs> questions or comments? All right. I think um, we're. Oh. I guess I have one more. One more. So uh, this is this kind of looks like what I think stood to future uh, should look like. I had kind of envisioned having a, pol a polling model because you know people if people aren't ha I, my my impression was that it was a little drastic to expect people to completely give up on a synchronous API. But after seeing this talk, I'm sort of, I, I sort of could get on board with this. So do you think that, that this is the sort of design that we should, uh, we should look at for Script 2 uh, so, to replace Future? So the question was, um, there was some context to the question, but the question was, do I think that this is the kind of design that should replace uh, Stood Future like in Stood 2? And I definitely think that this should should do that. Uh, I plan on, at some point, maybe with your help, writing a proposal for doing exactly that. I just want to talk about the future anyway. Uh, there are lots of proposals about having a wait keyword, which would basically allow us to have a more synchronous flow for asynchronous operations. That would probably tie into this. Is there anything known about that right now? So the comment was that there's some kind of a wait proposal which seems related to this and coroutines, 
Yes. Uh, we, gore routines, <laughs> as it's uh, commonly called. Uh, yes, it, it very much relates to this. And the semantics here are actually usable to ensure that coroutines work properly as you expect and are as powerful as you need, uh, which they are. <laughs> but the current here, yes, coroutines will work with this kind of features, but coroutines want different kind of better features than this kind. Oh, so the comment is... No, 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 no. Whether, whether those features are better or not depends solely on the use case for the future. I think, I think everybody... It depends on the use cases. Cases. <laughs> I, I disagree. I think that I think that wait, that this is a, that the, this is a feature that we all want. No, <laughs> <laughs> we we all accept you. <laughs> no, it doesn't support RAII. It has no lifetime semantics. Uh, uh, no. What, right. <laughs> Why? You can you can trivially do like uh, when you track the last. This is fine for garbage collected languages. This no, is not no, fine. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, this works. This works with where I am. Uh, C++ is like kind of garbage. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this uh, is uh, diverging uh, into a discussion. Go, go see, uh, go, go see uh, Sean Parent's talk of, on futures to see how it works with RAI. Okay, so there's some discussion about RAI and different <laughs> ideas for what uh, a future stood future should be. Um, I'm not going to repeat the discussion, but it was very interesting. Uh, <laughs> any other? This is why you should come to the conference. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you should come to the conference, was what somebody said. So, yes. All right, are there any other uh, questions? No? Going once, going twice, we're done. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs>